بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله يجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن سار على نهجه واهتدى بهديه إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This uh, lecture today will be our final in this series of classes on on heart therapy. And even though there is more that we can talk about concerning a'mal uh, al the actions of the heart, but due to uh, time constraints of traveling at the end of this week and then when I come back it's going to be close to the uh, the uh, winter break so we're going to have a conference in the winter break inshallah and then in January we'll start a new uh, a new class inshallah so this being the last uh, uh, lecture that we have we're going to try to cover uh, three three actions of the heart that are related with one another and that are usually mentioned together and these three are basically how they're, they're related to basically how the believer should live his life worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so how does a believer worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meaning what should you have in your heart when you're worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what kind of feeling should you have there? Should it be out of love? Or should it be out of fear? Or should it be out of hope? That you hope for Allah's reward, you hope for His mercy, etc. So Ibn Qayyim, he has a very, very famous and beautiful statement in this regard. He says, the heart on its journey towards Allah is like that of a bird. Love is its head and fear and hope are its two wings. When the head is healthy, then the two wings will fly well. When the head is cut off, the bird will die. When either of the two wings are damaged, the bird becomes vulnerable to every hunter and predator. Meaning that if one of the wings is damaged, then it won't be able to fly and it'll end up being open for every hunter and predator. So in order to function well in this life as a mu'min, as a believer, and in order to be rewarded with Allah's Jannah and His reward in the next, we need to balance between fear of Allah's punishment and hope for Allah's forgiveness and mercy and all the while at the same time have the love for Allah present at all times. And so putting too much emphasis on fear of Allah's punishment without any reason to do so, it leads to despair despairing the mercy of Allah and His forgiveness. On the other hand, putting too much emphasis on hope for Allah's mercy and forgiveness, without any reason to do so, it leads to, to negligence. And doing whatever you want in this life, thinking that Allah will forgive me. Ibn Qayyim, he also says, and this basically shows us how to balance how are we to balance between, especially between hope and fear? He says that the Salaf would prefer putting more emphasis on the wing of fear over the wing of hope during prosperous and healthy times. When you're healthy and things are going well in this dunya, put more emphasis on the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when at the time of leaving this dunya, when you're on your deathbed, 
and you're ready to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at this time he says they would pr prefer putting more emphasis on the wing of hope over the wing of fear because at this time now you're getting ready to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there's no time to do any good deeds or to rewind the past and so at this time you should be hoping for Allah's mercy and you should be thinking positively about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there are many verses in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has combined between the two between fear and hope showing us that this is what is required of us that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us for example Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says أَمَّنْ هُوَ قَانِتٌ آنَاءَ اللَّيْلِ سَاجِدًا وَقَائِمًا يَحْذَرُ الْآخِرَةِ وَيَرْجُوْ رَحْمَةَ رَبِّهِ يَحْذَرُ الْآخِرَةِ وَيَرْجُوْ رَحْمَةَ رَبِّهِ قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is the one who is devoutly obedient during periods of the night making sujood and in Qiyam, standing in Salah. And then here's a point. Fearing the hereafter while hoping for the mercy of his Lord. Is he like the one who is not like that? And so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the picture of a devout <coughs> worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where he combines the two. Fearing the Akhirah while at the same time hoping for hoping for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what we want to discuss. These three, these three uh, actions of the heart, which are very, very important to mention. And so we start with al-mahabba or love. And so we all know that love is something that originates from the heart. The heart is always used as a symbol of love. What is meant by love is that basically a person falls in love with someone or something to the point of preferring that thing or that person over everything else and over everybody else. And so this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires that we fall in love with Him so that we prefer him and his love over everything else. So that we prefer him and his love and his pleasure over everything else. And that is why the sin of a shirk is so great. Because it basically diminishes the love that we are supposed to have for Allah in our hearts. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in Surah Al-Baqarah. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا Among people are those who take other than Allah as their rivals. Basically, they take partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does Allah say regarding them? يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ They love them, these partners, as they should be loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ And the believers are stronger in their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those who commit shirk, they're basically dividing their love. They're dividing their love among the deities that they worship. And they claim to also be worshipping Allah. And so Allah only gets a small portion of their love. And so that's why someone who is in love with someone else, if he finds out that that other person is now sharing his love with a third person, what would happen? Obviously, it would fill him with rage and he would never forgive him. So how about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sharing his love with others? So this is 
the true love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're supposed to have. And so true love of Allah is basically to fill your heart with love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and basically empty out your love for everyone else and everything else. Giving precedence and preference to the love of Allah and His pleasure over the love of everything and everyone else. And that's why we see this in the lives of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And how their love of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was so great that they sacrificed everything that was beloved to them in this dunya. And so a father would disown his son if he was a kafir. And a son would disown his father if he was a kafir. To the point where if they met on the battlefield, in the various battles in Badr or Uhud, these companions would go out in search of their father or their son or their relative that is supposed to be beloved to them, in search of them for what? So that they could go and hug them? No. So that they could fight them and kill them. I mean, what degree of love is this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for His Messenger and for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the many examples of how they sacrificed their love for the dunya for the sake of their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how they gave. They gave their wealth that was beloved to them. And in many cases where they were more in need than those who they were giving to. As the example of the Ansar and how they would give to the Muhajirun and many, many other examples. And so this is basically the peak of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where basically you fill your heart with love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and prefer Allah's love and that which Allah loves and that which Allah is pleased with over everything and everyone else. But it should be understood here, one thing should be understood and that is that when we talk about love there are various kinds of love. And when we're talking about the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is a certain kind of love. That is different than other kinds of love. And so a husband loves his wife, a wife loves her husband. But that is a different kind of love. A mother loves her children. And children love their parents. A friend loves his friend, his companion, and so on and so forth. This is not the kind of love that, that, we're, that we're talking about here. What is the distinction? How do you distinguish between the love that we're supposed to have for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala versus these kinds of scenarios of where we love things of the dunya which are permissible and which are even obligatory. The way to distinguish is basically to see whether or not there is veneration and glorification involved. And so the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a kind of love that involves veneration and glorification for the one who you love, which is known as ta'zim. You venerate this person or you venerate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he deserves veneration and glorification and out of that you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This kind of love cannot be given to anyone else. And those who worship others, the kind of love they show them is a love of veneration and glorification. Whereas veneration and glorification is not involved in our love for one another. A man loving a woman, it does not involve veneration and glorification. 
children loving their mother or their father, it does not involve veneration and glorification. Rather, it is a natural kind of love that does not involve veneration and glorification. So, coming back to the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we say that all the believers vary in their degree of their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, although they share the original love in their heart. Meaning, that every believer has in his or her heart the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because without it, a person is not a believer. A person cannot be a believer if he does not love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the kind of love that we spoke about, veneration and glorification. However, there are different degrees of love among the believers. And so they differ. Just like the various degrees of Iman. Not everyone is at the same level. Just like the various degrees of taqwa and ihsan and so on and so forth. It exists in the heart of every believer, these, these things, the love for Allah, the taqwa of Allah, the iman is there, but, but it is of various degrees. So how can one develop the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his or her heart to the highest degree by two things the first is basically to cut off your relationship with what you are attached to of the dunya and what you are in love with it that which contradicts the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so basically everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbade that we are in love with or that which its benefit is not there for a person in the akhirah. It's permissible to enjoy that thing, but it won't really benefit, it won't bring you any benefit in the akhirah. And this is known as the concept of wara. Wara is to abandon something of the dunya because there's no benefit in that thing in the akhirah. On the other hand, zuhd is to abandon something of the dunya, to abandon something of the dunya because it may harm someone in the akhirah. It may harm someone in the akhirah. And once we truly love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then in turn Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us. But how do we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us? Everyone can claim to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but how many can claim that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves them? The way to know is by what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us when He said, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ Say, if you truly love Allah, then follow me. Meaning, follow the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then Allah will love you and will also forgive you your sins. So the more we obey the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the more we get of the love of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And so the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not something easy to gain. However, the one who does instigate the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning that Allah loves him, then we have a hadith in this regard. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told us that if Allah loves a servant, then he calls upon Jibreel alayhi salam and says that indeed Allah loves so and so, so you love him. So Jibreel alayhi salam loves him. And then Jibreel calls on the, on the inhabitants of the heavens, meaning the angels, and says, indeed Allah has loved so and so, so you also love him. Then after that, the inhabitants of the heavens, meaning 
the angels love him and then he is granted this person is granted acceptance by the inhabitants of earth meaning that the people accept this individual so this is concerning concerning the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after that we move on to the second the second action of the heart that we're talking about tonight and that is fear or al-khawf fear or al-khawf and so fear is basically a feeling that exists in the heart a painful feeling that results from expecting some kind of harm in the future in the near future that you're afraid of something because that thing you're expecting it to happen or and also you know every time you remember that thing your heart it trembles so this is the definition of fear but now the fear with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a little bit different And that is because whatever you fear in this dunya, whatever you fear in this dunya, what do you do? You take every precaution against it. You avoid it. You, you flee away from it. On the other hand, the fear for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heart, it makes you to flee to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not away from Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the amazing thing about the fear for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so fear of Allah is obligatory upon each and every single believer. And no one is guaranteed safety from Allah's punishment except by fearing him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِي إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Do not fear them, meaning the enemies, but rather fear me, if you are indeed true believers. Also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَا تَخْشَوُ النَّاسَ وَخْشَوْنِي Do not fear the people, but rather fear me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says regarding the one who fears him subhanahu wa ta'ala and fears standing before him subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. The one who fears standing before his Lord and he prevents his nafs from, from its desires then indeed Jannah will be his place of refuge. And the Prophet ﷺ said in a Hadith Qudsi, and the Hadith Qudsi, as we're all aware of, is basically that Hadith where it is the words of Allah subhanahu wa or rather it is the speech of Allah. Allah addresses us, but in the words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Whereas the Quran is the actual words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Allah says, <coughs> by my might, I will not, let, I will not allow my servant to suffer from fear in two realms or feel safe in two realms if he feels safe from me in this dunya i will make him feel fear on the day of resurrection but if he fears me in this dunya i will make him feel safe on the day of resurrection so all of these Ayat and ahadith, what they show us is 
that we must fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an integral part of the actions of the heart that every single believer must have. Now, the question is how can we fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or what must we do in order to attain that level of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His punishment? Furthermore, how can one who loves Allah develop the fear for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And so some people they think that these two are opposites that cannot be combined in the heart of one individual. And that's why the two religions who went astray, Judaism and Christianity, both of them, they put more emphasis on one over the other. And so the Jews put more emphasis on the fear of Allah, even though it was not a real fear. Because if it was a real fear, then they would not have deviated. But ra rather, they would have truly feared Allah and His punishment and not and not have, you know, distorted their books and gone astray. But their religion is full of rituals related to crying and fear and so on and so forth. On the other hand, you had Christianity, which only called to the love. The love of Jesus, the love for God, and so on and so forth. Whereas Islam came and taught us to put a balance between both. And so although we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we also fear His punishment. And so there are many ways that can help us to develop the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our hearts. Among these are, for example, bringing to mind the seriousness of sins and the grave danger of, of, of the major sins because the major sins are those sins which there is a set punishment for them in the Akhirah and the one who does not repent from those sins it is feared that he will, he will be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Akhirah with the hellfire and then also the minor sins. They are dangerous for the one who the minor sins become a habit for him. And he doesn't turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in repentance. Secondly, by getting to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How does knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lead to the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Ibn Qayyim, he says, the more a person knows Allah, the more he will fear Him. Ibn Mas'ud said, Fear of Allah is sufficient, is a sufficient indication of knowledge. Lack of fear of Allah is due to a person's lack of knowledge of Him. The more knowledgeable, the most knowledgeable of people are those who fear Allah the most. If a person knows Allah, he will be more embarrassed before him he will fear him more and will love him more the more his knowledge increases the more his shyness his fear and his love for Allah increases so getting to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his names and his attributes this makes us to venerate Allah to see his greatness and then to fear to fear transgressing the boundaries that he's put in place. Also by reflecting upon those ayat in the Quran that speak about Allah's punishment for those who disobey him. The various images of hellfire that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us detailed descriptions of to reflect over these verses, to ponder over them. This develops the fear for Allah in our hearts. And that's why the Prophet وسلم, would, when he would come across 
such ayat. And he was reciting in his salah, he would stop and seek refuge in Allah from his punishment. And yet, most of us, we hear these ayat day in, day out, and nothing happens. Why? Because we don't stop and ponder and reflect over these ayat. Also, by reflecting upon the condition of the people when they are resurrected on the Day of Judgment. And looking at the great distress that will fall the people on that day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a vivid image of this in the beginning of Surah Al-Hajj, the very opening of Surah Al-Hajj. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts by saying, Ya ayyuha nas Ya ayyuha nas uttaqu rabbakum inna zalzalat as-sa'ati shay'un azim O mankind, fear your Lord. Indeed, the, the, the earthquake or the tremble of the day of judgment is a great thing. يَوْمَ تَرَوْنَهَا And then Allah gives us vivid images of that day. يَوْمَ تَرَوْنَهَا تَذْهَلُ كُلُّ مُرْضِعَةٍ عَمَّا أَرْضَعَتْ وَتَضَعُ كُلُّ ذَاتِ حَمْلٍ حَمْلَهَا وَتَرَى النَّاسَ سُكَارَ وَمَا هُمْ بِسُكَارَ وَلَكِنَّ عَذَابَ اللَّهِ شَدِيدٌ On the day you will see it, every nursing mother will abandon her infant. And every pregnant one will drop her load. And you will see people as if they are drunk, but they are not drunk, but severe will be the punishment of Allah. This is only one example of how the state of the people will be on that day. Reading about this in the ayat that Allah has mentioned in the Quran or through the various ahadith, it develops a fear for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his punishment. Also, among those things that can help us to develop the fear for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our hearts is to attend those lectures or khutbas or reminders where there are admonitions, reminders that are heart softening. And so we have an example of this from the hadith of Irbad ibn Sariya radiallahu an. He says, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam delivered a very, very eloquent admonition, Mawidha Baligha, which caused the eyes to flow with tears and the hearts to tremble with fear. So this shows us that such lectures or khutbas or reminders, they develop the fear for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in the hearts. And that's why it's not right to only give lectures on topics related to the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hope, and so on and so forth, and not to discuss things that will develop the fear for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There has to be moderation and balance between the two. Also, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with one's heart and one's tongue. The more you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more, the more you fear Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the one who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at every instant, how can he transgress the bounds that Allah has put in place? How can he do something haram if he's remembering and conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala watching him? And so the one who remembers Allah, it causes him to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and abstain from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram. Also fearing, fearing sudden punishment. 
fearing sudden punishment. And Allah refers to this in the Quran as and ta'tiyahum as-sa'atu baghtatan that the hour meaning the day of judgment will come to them all of a sudden and so Ibn Qayyim he says fear of Allah stems from three things being aware of one's offense and how abhorrent it is the second believing the warning and that Allah has prescribed the punishment for the sin and thirdly Remembering that one does not know, perhaps one will be prevented from repenting and something may bar one from doing so if one was to commit the sin. So the one, <coughs> the one who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he also fears that maybe he'll never get a chance to make tawbah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send the angel of death to take away his soul suddenly. This is what we call the sudden death. And so remembering this, keeping this in mind that you can die at any moment. And perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish you by taking away your soul while you are committing the sin. While you are committing the sin. This causes you to develop fear for Allah and His punishment in your heart. So this is basically concerning concerning the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We now come to the final action of the heart that we want to discuss. And that is Ar-Raja' or hope. And so... What is meant by hope is basically that a person, he he basically longs for something. He longs for that which he wholeheartedly desires, that it comes into existence. You put your hope in something, that I will attain this thing, I will achieve this thing. Hope in the context of what we are discussing here is that the believer, he puts his hope in attaining the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He puts his hope that Allah will accept his good deeds. He puts his hope in the forgiveness of his sins. He's hoping that Allah will be kind with him. He basically puts his hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so hope is opposite to despair. Hope is opposite to despair because hope basically pushes you to do good deeds. On the other hand, despair, it holds you back from doing good deeds. So what is despair? Despair is a person who has lost hope. He's gone into despair. He thinks that his sins are so great that Allah can never forgive him. So he goes into despair. He doesn't think that Allah will ever forgive him. So what does he do? He stops doing good deeds. Because he thinks there's no benefit in it. There's no benefit in me doing these good deeds because I'm doomed that's it I'm destined for the hellfire why should I do any good deeds so this is called despair on the other hand hope it pushes you to do good deeds now hope is of three kinds hope is of three kinds the first is the hope of someone who performs an act of ibadah sincerely and correctly hoping for Allah's reward. So you do an act of ibadah 
you pray or you recite the Quran or you fast or you give in sadaqah whatever it be a good deed an act of ibadah you do it sincerely it was sincerely for the sake of Allah with ikhlas and you do it correctly meaning the way Allah prescribed it and then <coughs> you're done from the deed and you hope that Allah will accept it and you hope that you will get the reward for that action in the akhirah this is the first the second is the hope of someone who commits sins he commits sins and then he turns to Allah in sincere repentance hoping for Allah's forgiveness so the second is the hope of someone who sins and then he turns to Allah in sincere repentance and what is sincere repentance? It's something that a per, it's, it's something that involves regret for that sin. It's something that comes with the determination to never go back to that sin ever again. So he commits certain sins and then he sincerely turns to Allah in repentance, not going back to that sin, hoping that Allah will forgive him. The third is the hope of someone who indulges in sin hoping for Allah's mercy without repenting and without doing any good deeds so this is we this is what we call a false hope the one who indulges in sin hoping for Allah's mercy hoping that Allah will be kind with him hoping that Allah will forgive his sins but yet he does not turn to Allah in sincere repentance and he doesn't do any good deeds that perhaps these good deeds will will erase my sins so this is called false hope and so the first two examples the first two kinds this is the correct hope and this is the hope that we are required to have this is the hope that we are required to have. That whatever good deeds we do, we hope that Allah will accept them from us and that Allah will reward us for them. And whatever sins we do, when we turn to Allah for forgiveness, we hope that Allah will forgive us. But this third kind, this is the false hope, hope that many people have, which is the false kind of hope and that is because they have put all of their emphasis on on hope forgetting about what we spoke about earlier and that is the fear that they should have for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his punishment and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that we put our hope in him and in his mercy Allah wants us to hope for His mercy. He doesn't want us to fall into despair. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَالَّذِينَ هَاجَرُوا وَجَاهَدُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أُولَٰئِكَ يَرْجُونَ رَحْمَةَ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Indeed, those who believe and those who immigrate and fight for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are the ones who hope for Allah's mercy and Allah is forgiving and merciful. Why does Allah say at the end of the ayah and Allah is forgiving and merciful? To indicate that these people who put their hope in Allah's mercy that Allah is all forgiving towards them and merciful towards them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِدَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا Whoever hopes for meeting his Lord, then let him do righteous good deeds and let him not to associate in the worship of his Lord anyone. So if you truly hope to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the akhirah and expect 
Allah to reward you and that he forgives you your sins then then do this do righteous good deeds and do not commit any shirk however at the same time there are times when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accompanies his mercy along with instilling fear of punishment in our hearts to show us that Allah wants balance Allah wants us to be balanced and moderate and not put one wing heavier than the other and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many different places in the Quran accompanies his mercy with his punishment inna rabbaka ladhu maghfiratin wa dhu iqabin alim your lord is the possessor of forgiveness and also the possessor of painful punishment inna rabbaka sari'u al-iqab wa innahu laghafur rahim your lord is swift in punishment and also he is forgiving and he is merciful and so the relationship between hope and fear as we mentioned earlier is like that of a bird and its two wings what happens to a bird whose one wing is damaged it won't be able to fly it has to have both wings fully functioning in order for it to fly perfectly and so we have two wings and they are the wing of hope and the wing of fear now fear is not the opposite of hope like some people may think but rather it is the companion of hope if it was the opposite of fear then Allah would not want us to have hope but rather it is its companion as we can see in these ayat because just like hope pushes you to do good actions so does fear and we already spoke about that hope a person who has hope for Allah hope for Allah's mercy hope that Allah will reward him in the akhirah it pushes him to do good deeds and also fear a person who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it pushes him to do good deeds the only difference is in the way that each one pushes you to do good deeds and so hope pushes you through what is known as raghbah and so Allah mentions many different things in the Quran that pushes us to do good deeds all of these things are concerning the reward in the akhirah so Allah talks about Jannah and the various people who will be in Jannah because of their good deeds this is called raghba Allah is encouraging us to do good deeds through mention of his reward on the other hand fear it pushes us towards good deeds through a rahba which is basically by Allah mentioning in the Quran various things that that cause fear in our hearts of the punishment for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this makes us to want to do good deeds in order to not be among those who will be punished so fear and hope as we said are the two birds of a wing uh, are, are, are the two wings of a bird if they level the bird will level and if one is deficient the flying will be defective now the cure of hope is required by one of two the cure of hope is required by one of two the first is someone who fears someone who who basically the concept of fear of Allah's punishment it dominates him to the point where he goes into extremes in the worship of Allah and it makes him to harm himself and his family so he fears Allah's punishment so much that he's just doing good deeds and neglecting himself and neglecting his family he goes to an extreme why because he's so afraid so for this we say take the pill of hope 
there's something called hope for Allah's forgiveness. Hope for Allah's mercy. The second is someone who despair dominates him. To the point where he abandons worship altogether as we mentioned earlier. Someone who despair is on his mind. He's committed so many sins and he reads about the punishment of Allah and he thinks he will never be forgiven by Allah. So for this person we say take the pill of of hope. There's something called hope for Allah's mercy and Allah's forgiveness. Look at what Allah talks about himself, about his mercy, about his forgiveness and so on and so forth. So basically these two individuals have deviated from from the balanced position. So they need to be brought back to that balanced position. As for one who basically indulges in sin, having wrong hope in Allah, while abandoning the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the medicine of hope is considered poisonous for such an individual. We don't tell him that there's something called hope for Allah's mercy and Allah's forgiveness. For such a deluded person, no medicine is better for him than the medicine of a fear. For this individual, you instill fear into his heart. That there's something called a fear, that there's something called the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for these sins that you are indulging in. And so the point is that we need to look at each illness in the heart and give it the suitable medicine that will bring it back to the natural balanced position. And so with that we come to the end of these three actions of the heart that we discussed tonight. tonight. Love, fear, and hope. And with that we come to the end of this series of lectures on heart therapy. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all beneficial knowledge. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to be among those who follow up their knowledge with action, action that leads to his pleasure and wards us away from his punishment.